the school, like all that emergency stuff. But like I think that's why I wanted to make sure the home thing is all right guys let's go ahead and get started wow this is some crowd here today for a friday you know i might say well we just have a lot of people on zoom we got two well that sucks for everybody who's not here because we're going over some pretty intensive stuff now so good good for you <laughs> What's the oh no for? I mean, you should be excited to like, you know, sink your teeth into some real, real organic chemistry here. <laughs> no, this is all, this is all them fake stuff. This is the real stuff. No, I'm kidding. It is, it is a bit involved, but yes, yeah, it's, it's entirely doable. I hope you like drawing resonance structures. We're going to draw a whole lot of all right, so, uh, but before we get to that, before we get to the resonance structure part of it, there's one last thing I want to mention. Uh, we ran out of time today before I could finish completely talking about freedom press alkylation. All right, so if you'll remember, freedom press alkylation, we said that, you know, we had a benzene ring. We could put on an alkyl group. Yeah, and we can tailor, you know, what type of alkyl group we want to put on our ring by changing whatever the alkyl chloride was, right? So if we put a CH3Cl in there as our uh, alkyl chloride, we would put a methyl group. If we wanted to put an ethyl group on there, we would put a corresponding ethyl group on your alpha, from your alpha chloride. All right. What if we want to put a propyl group? Put a three carbon chain alpha chloride. Get that? No. That doesn't work. You're going to see friedel crafts alkylation is going to be the most annoying out of all of these reactions because there's a couple little quirks that it has, a couple little nuances. You've seen one of them. You've seen the fact that there's two slightly different mechanisms depending on what type of alkyl chloride. This is going to be another one. In this case, your product would be that isopropyl benzene. And I see some of you looking at that with kind of a confused look on your face, thinking, how in the heck do you get that? Two words carbocation rearrangement. Uh, you guys remember talking about carbocation rearrangements? They suck, don't they? They still suck. And we definitely run into them with free crafts reactions. However, we actually even run into a little bit of an aspect of them that we haven't seen yet. All right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to redo this one, but we're going to go through the mechanism. We're going to see exactly how we end up with isopropyl benzene. All right, so we have our alpha chloride. And we have our catalyst. All right. So for a primary alpha chloride in a free press alkylation, what's the first step of the mechanism? Y'all tell me. Y'all should have this in your notes. Mm -hmm. 
we have an alkyl chloride and we have AlCl3. What, what is the role of Cl, AlCl3? What are we using it for? CL. Yeah, aluminum trichloride is an Lewis acid catalyst, right? That means it's gonna accept electrons and we said it can accept an electron pair from your CL. Does the CL just hop off and go to the aluminum or does the whole thing? Whole thing, right? So, did somebody just shoot a laser pointer up here? Sorry, I actually plugged in. You're not like, you're not like doing stuff to me while I have my back turned on. No. You know, no, it's on my head. If I hear giggling, I'm gonna be so scared. <laughs> We have a psychotic corgi at my house, and uh, he has seriously, he has like just bundles of energy. So we found that he will like to chase around the laser pointer on the floor a lot like a cat. He can do that for hours. Okay, so you make this complex, all right? So, what would you expect the next part of the mechanism to be based off of what we showed you yesterday or Wednesday? I say expect because you know I'm going to tell you this, it's wrong, but what would you expect? Okay, so basically, what we learned the other day, this whole complex would flutter over towards the benzene ring. This CL would dissociate from your carbon, and at the same time, this whole thing would attach here. Does that sound familiar? Hopefully it does, right? That actually does not happen in this case. You get something kind of weird. What happens is, instead, this will temporarily or this will this CL will actually go ahead and fully break off, and you will temporarily form a primary carbocation. Now you haven't seen that before. We've always talked about how primary carbocations are really unstable and they don't form, and that's all true. However, this case is a bit of an exception because. Basically, if you can think of, you know, a carbon chain having feelings and thoughts and stuff, this carbon chain sees, is thinking, it sees an opportunity to actually make a more stable carbocation. It sees a chance to make a secondary. How can it do that? It's not going to be resonance. That's where you move electrons. Or that's where you would move, you know, pi and unshared pairs of I think you're on the right track, but it's not called resonance. What could we move over? Ray, what did you say? The positive charge. The positive charge would move over, but there's a reason for it. We got to, we would have to have a reason for this to be positive. Think about what's attached here, right? We have hydrogens attached, all right? What's one type of carbocation rearrangement we learned about previously? Remember, there are two types. One was called an alkyl shift. The other one was, I think whenever, you know, the class is stumped on something, I could just like reflexively call in one of my TAs to see if they can, you know, fill in the blanks. I drive Ooh, Skylar showing off today. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Is that what you guys were going to say? Well, I'll give you guys credit. High drive shift, right? Sorry, Skylar had to really be a glory hog and, you know, step in there. And, you know, yeah, you can actually get a high drive shift here. And what this does is this creates a secondary carbocation. <laughs> And that species is what actually attacks your double bond. Okay. 
So that's something that you have to keep an eye out for in Friedel Crafts alkylations. If it is possible to create a more stable carbocation, i.e. going from a primary to a secondary or a secondary to tertiary, it can and will happen with these. All right. We're going to revisit this a little bit later in the chapter and see a couple more examples. And also, importantly, how do we get around this problem? How can we make propyl benzene? It exists. There's a way to make it, but you can't do it this way. Okay. So it's a good, another good example of where drawing the mechanism can kind of really help you as far as predicting the products because it's a little bit hard to just visualize a C plus rearrangement here, I think, until you kind of draw things out. Okay. Does that make sense? Y'all have any questions about that? It's happy poker faces too. We only have two male students today. It's Ben and Gray. I'm not counting you, Skyler. You're not. A, you're a TA. You don't. You're not part of the group. It's a funny quirk I noticed looking at the audience. All right. There's also a couple of other little quirks of Friedel Crafts oscillations. Again, I'm going to come back to those later on in the chapter. All right. One thing that you might notice: all of the reactions we've done so far have been strictly two benzene. All right, we take it, we've just been taking plain old benzene and sticking something on. You can take a, a benzene ring that already has a substituent and then put something else on it. For example, let's say we had toluene, all right? We can put something on a toluene ring We could do a nitration, right? Remember, if you do a nitration, that puts a nitro group on. So, what's our product going to look like? Well, we just put NO2 on the ring, right? What's the, what's the conundrum? What's the question? Which carbon does it go on? You got three different spots if you go, right? Could go here. Could go here. Could go here. Ortho, meta, or pair, right? Well, it's not going to be random. There are going to be preferred spots. All right, so there's going to be two features of existing substituents that are going to be important to look at. Number one, we're going to see what kind of directors they are. And by what type of directors, that means where does it steer incoming substituents to go? There's certain substituents that might like to put a new substituent at a meta position. Others like ortho or para. Okay. There's features, structural features you can look at to figure it out. And also there's a list of your book that you can memorize as well. I'd recognize being, I would recommend being good. Both, both of them. The other thing that we're going to look at is whether these substituents are activators or deactivators, right? Benzene has a certain reactivity, right? Sometimes if you already have a substituent on benzene and you try a subsequent reaction, this reaction might be more powerful. It might be easier to do. Other times, it might be less reactive. 
So certain substituents can either be activators, in other words, they make the benzene ring more reactive, or deactivators, they make it less reactive. Sometimes something can be such a deactivator that it'll completely shut down a reaction or completely shut down the reactivity of the ring. Sometimes, conversely, you can have something that's so activating it makes the sub any subsequent reactions kind of run out of control. A little bit. And you have stuff in between. So these are going to be two things that we're going to look at. And basically in each case, what we have to do is we have to look at the substituent itself and see what it does as far as its electron donating or withdrawing capability. All right. I'm actually going to start with the activation of the activation. All right, so we can define a substituent as being an activator if it is overall electron donating. To your ring. And as you might expect, the activators are the opposite. They're electron withdrawn. So basically, if you think about it here, this makes sense. In an electrophilic aromatic substitution, your benzene ring reacts with what type of species? In electrophilic aromatic substitution, what type of species reacts with the ring? <laughs> Maybe you guys didn't hear me. In electrophilic aromatic substitution, what type of species reacts with the ring? Very good. Outstanding. Yeah. An electrophile. What type of charge does an electrophile typically have on it? Positive. Positive or partially positive, right? So it stands to reason that the more negative your ring is, the stronger the attraction. Does that make sense? Because opposite charges attract. So if you're donating electron density to the ring, you're making it more negative, which makes it more attractive to an electrophile. Conversely, if you're withdrawing electron density, you're actually making the ring more positive and that causes more repulsion. Okay, does that make sense? That's kind of the basis for that. Now, how do you recognize whether something's electron donating or electron withdrawn? There's two factors you have to look at. All right, let me put a sample one up here. A ketone group, right? We're going to see what this ketone group is. All right, there's two factors that can cause you to either lose or gain electron density in the ring. The first is an inductive effect. And we've talked about inductive effects before, right? Remember way back in chapter two. We talked about the four acidity effects. The inductive effect was one of them. Right? What do you typically look for when you're looking for an inductive effect? Y'all remember? Okay, I saw a couple of head shakes, that's fine. Basically, you're trying to find electronegative at whether you have electronegative atoms present or not. All right? Remember, the more electronegative an atom is, the more it's going to sort of exert a pull on general electron density from elsewhere in the molecule. Right? So basically here, look at your substituent. Look at the ketone here. Do you have any electronegative atoms in that substituent? 
See some nods? What's, what's the electronegative atom? Oxygen, right. So inductively, this oxygen is sort of pulling electron density towards it, towards itself. And that means away from the ring. So inductively, this is electron withdrawn. So basically, yeah, if your, sub, if your um, substituent has like an oxygen or nitrogen or halogen or some sort of combination thereof, yeah, you're going to have an electron withdrawing substituent, at least inductive. Okay. Does that make sense? All right. The other factor is due to resonance. So there's a bit of a resonance effect here as well. And I mentioned you're going to be drawing lots of resonance structures. This is kind of where that starts. So basically what you want to do here is you want to look at this. And you want to see if there are any resonance structures that you can draw. And if so, do those resonance structures make the ring more positive or more negative? Okay. Take a look at this. See if y'all can tell me any possible ways that I can draw resonance. Hint, yes, you can. So what, what would that be? Like this? Yeah. Yep. You could do that for sure. That would leave this carbon with an incomplete octet. All right. Is there anything that would sort of domino effect? Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm not going to draw all the resonance structures for this, but drawing this one does illustrate our point. This is one of the resonance structures that you can draw. For this species. Okay. What happened to the ring in that resonance structure uh, structure. Sorry. Did it get more positive or negative? More positive. So did we withdraw electron density or add or donate it? We withdrew it. Yeah. So this one's also electron withdrawing due to resonance. So this one's pretty, everything's pretty much in agreement here, right? This is definitely an electron withdrawing substituent. So according to our definition, a ketone group be a deactivator. Okay. That's something that you guys are going to, you know, have to do. Um, you're going to need to be able to take a structure, look at a substituent, and be able to figure out is an electron withdrawing due to resonance? Is an electron withdrawing? Inductively, is it electron withdrawing or not overall? Okay. Any questions so far? All right, let's take a look at another one. Let's take a look at phenol. See what an OH group does. All right, what do y'all think? You guys tell me. 
what do you think an OH group is going to do inductively? What's that? Yeah, just like we saw last time, right? You have an electronegative oxygen. So it's really, it's going to start pulling some electron density its way away from the ring. So that one is electron withdrawing. How about resonance? I mean, drawing resonance structures. Yeah, exactly. In this case, you could take one of those unshared pairs on oxygen, pop it down into a double bond, and that forces this pair of electrons solely over here. Gives you that. All right. So, due to resonance, is the OH group electron withdrawing or electron donating? Did the ring get more negative or more positive? Okay, it's just like written right there with a the old sign. I'm just trying to get you to say the words because you know interaction is fun. It's more negative, right? So if it gets more negative, it's got extra electron density, right? So is that electron donating or withdrawing due to resonance? What's that? Donating. Yes, thank you. So looks like we have a little bit of a disagreement here. This happens quite a bit. Your inductive effects and your resonance effects don't always agree with each other. So which one wins? There's something to remember. When your inductive effect and your resonance effect disagree with, with uh, sorry, disagree with each other, almost always resonance wins. The resonance effect tends to be more powerful than the inductive effect. So in this case, OH would be overall electron uh, donating and overall it would be an activator. Yeah, does that make sense? Are there any questions so far? All right, I said almost always resonance wins. You know, there's always an exception. There he is. The exception is the halogens. You can have a halogen on here. We'll just put like a fluorine or something like that. You see, basically, we run into the same situation, right? Cl is really electronegative, so it withdraws due to the inductive effect. But it also has electrons it could use to form a double bond here and make a negative ring. It just so happens that with halogens, the inductive effect is stronger. And that's just something you have to remember. So, but every other case, resonance will win out.
All right. Any questions on activation deactivation? All right. Now for the really good stuff, directing. Get ready for resonance of Palooza here. We're going to draw so many resonance structures. It's going to be awesome. All right. So one thing we can also do is we can try to figure out what type of director a particular substituent is. Where does, you know, for example, an OH group like to place new substituents? All right. Well, let's take a look. Here's what you have to do. All right. You know part of this. All right. We'll just go ahead and go ahead. You know part of the mechanism is going to involve an electrophile coming in, attaching itself to the ring and creating a carbocation, right? What you have to do is you have to draw hypothetical scenarios, hypothetical resonance structures if it went to ortho, if it went to meta, if it went to para, and you compare all of them together to see if there's anything that's especially stabilizing or especially destabilizing. Okay? So for example, we took this one, we would start off and draw all the possible resonance structures for ortho substitution. Yeah, it's a bit of a tedious process, but it works. All right. So here's how we start. All right, so we're just hypothetically drawing everything that can occur if we put the electrophile at the ortho position, right? So that's what we've done. That would create a carbocation right there. Because these electrons would be taken away from the spark. Right? So that's one resonance structure. Then we start rotating the merry-go-round of electrons. We could make another structure if we brought this one around over there. And that changes the position of the positive charge. Did we draw a third? See a couple of nods. How can you draw a third? Yeah, you got another double bond here, right? Why not take it and rotate it up there? Absolutely. Okay. Can you draw any more? Give me a hint. The answer is yes. There is one more you can draw. And then figure out how to do it. It's not like you can rotate this one down or anything, right? It's too far away. Can the hydrogen be figured out? Yeah, the prize is I respect. <laughs> <laughs> and really, what's more valuable than that? I'm gonna give you a little hint on this one. Oh yes, go ahead, Sarah. Ooh, I didn't have to give a hint. You figured it out. Good job, Sarah. Yeah, you look at this one. You know, 
We satisfied this positive charge before by bringing this pair of electrons around. There's another way you could do it. You could also bring a pair down from the oxygen. <coughs> make a double bond right there. So yeah, this one has four resonance structures. So four possible resonance structures for carbocation formation, substitution at the ortho position. Okay. Everybody got those? Unfortunately, since I'm having limited board space here because of Zoom, I'm going to have to erase and redraw. So you'll have to refer to your notes. All right, so then we start all over at the meta position. So that's the first structure if we hypothetically had an electrophile get to the meta position. All right, how do we get a second one? Yep, play merry go around with the electrons, right? This pair of electrons could swoop down there. Then we could draw a third if this pair of electrons swoop over here. Those copy down. I say merry go round of electrons, but it's really kind of like that's kind of pretty close to the truth here, right? You're literally just kind of dropping down double bonds, moving those uh, pi bonds around to satisfy those positive charges in each case. All right? Can we draw a fourth one? Can we do what we did last time? I see a couple of people very reluctantly shaking their heads in there. Why not? You're right, by the way, you can't. Why not? What, did we, what situation did we have last time? Where was that initial positive charge in the molecule? Where was it located relative to your substituent? Yeah, if you look at the last one, right? One of your resonance structures had a positive charge on the carbon right next to your OH, right? So it was really easy just to take a pair of oxygens, electrons, swoop them down to immediately satisfy the double bond. In this case, this carbon is never positive. So that means you can't do that. So in this case, you're stuck with three. That's all you have. Yep. All right. I'm going to give you guys a couple of minutes here. See if you can draw the pair of ones on your own. I'll draw them up here in just a couple of minutes, but I want to give you a chance to draw them on your own. See if you can compare to what I put on the board.
Let's go ahead and draw this. All right, so para, hopefully this will match up fairly well with what we have. So if I want to put something in the para position, electric file is going to go here. There's our initial carbocation. Oh, uh, ugly hexagon. All right, so we can play merry go round with the electrons again. We can swoop this pair down. It forms that. We could swoop this pair of electrons around over there. That. Is there anything else we can do? Oxygen. Yeah, yeah, very similar situation to what we saw on the ortho, right? You have unshared pairs directly adjacent to your positive charge, so you can also draw this. So this one, in this case, you have four possible resonance structures for a pair. Okay. So there you go. We drew 11 resonance structures overall for hypothetical ortho meta pair substitution. Right. So what do we do with this? Well, you look, go back at the end and you look at it. You look to see, are there any particular reasons you would have extra stabilization at certain positions or any particular reasons you would have extra destabilization? What's kind of aggravating is there's not one singular thing you can look for every time. Sometimes it's a little bit more subtle than others. In this case, I think there's a pretty obvious difference amongst the ortho, meta, and para substitutions. What's the big difference? between what you would get ortho, what you would get meta, what you would get para. The placement of the substituents. What's that? The Where's placement it? of the substituents. The red, I'm sorry, could you? Placement of the substituents. Placement, okay. Um, there are definitely gonna be you know, diff three different possibilities. What about differences within the resonance structures themselves? Are there, is there anything especially stabilizing or destabilizing about any of these three? Ortho, meta, or para. Well, just looking at the ones on your paper, what, like, for example, is there a difference between what you see between ortho and meta? I see a couple of nods. What, what's the big difference between ortho and meta? He nods, but nobody wants to say anything. Don't be afraid to get a wrong answer. Yes, yeah, I guess. Looking at your set for ortho and your set for meta, what's the difference? Ortho is four minus three. Yeah, ortho's got four, meta's got three. Right? More resonance equals more stability. So if you're looking at your three sets there, ortho, meta, and para, meta has only three resonance structures as compared to the others. So what that's telling you is that it's more stable to have an ortho or a para substitution than it is to have a meta substitution. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's probably the most obvious one is where you can just simply count the number of resonance structures in each case. So for that reason, we would say that an OH group is what we call an ortho-para-directive. 
Funny little quirk about these. Substituents can be either ortho para directors or they can be meta directors. You do not have a separate ortho director or a separate para. Ortho and para come as a package deal. If you get one, you get the other. Meta, if something's a meta director, that's the only place it puts it, is meta. So in this case, OH has been proven to be ortho para. Okay. That makes sense. Like I said, don't look for the same thing every time. I mean, sometimes you can look for the numbers of resonance structures. Other times you have to look for more subtle things like, um, you know, proximity of charges. Do you have like two like charges that are close to each other? That's bad, right? That's destabilizing. That might be something you have to look for. Um, proximity of partial charges whether you have primary, secondary, or tertiary carbocations, all right? So, it's important to kind of work through several of these and kind of see some of the nuances. This would be the next one I would recommend trying. Let's go ahead and we would try to do a ketone group. That's what we're going to lead off with Monday, Monday, yeah, on Monday. Uh, go ahead and try working through that. We'll see what we come up with. See if you can figure out what's the work meta up there. I mean, you could just like look in the book and look at the list and say, oh yeah, it's this, but see if you can work through the resonance structures. All right, we'll pick up with that one on Monday. <laughs> Just because it's